good morning, good afternoon, and good ridiculous hour of the night you are most likely watching this video at. I am here today to make a more genuine video about Pride Month, as opposed to, well, my usual jokes and memes. That being said, this is my own experience with Pride Month this year, and my own experience with identity in general. I wanted to make a video that scratches the surface of what furry is, and how it connects to the idea of queer identity. Because people may have noticed, there is a pretty strong connection between the two. If you hate the mere idea of furry, and if you hate the mere idea of gay people, in which case please get off my channel, this may not be the video for you. Note that I will be referring to the LGBTQIA community as the queer community for simplicity's sake through the duration of this video. That is because that is the label that I use as part of that community. But without any further disclaimers, let's get right to it. Alright, so to start us off, what is furry and what is the origin of furry? It's a question I find being answered a lot around the internet, and the answer is quite simple. A person with an interest in anthropomorphic, meaning holding human characteristic, animal characters. Anthropomorphism has been used since the dawn of media and even before then to explain relatable emotional arcs in a way that captures the attention of a more fantasy setting. For example, the candlestick from Beauty and the Beast and Aesop's Fables. The world itself can be traced back to its roots, meaning anthropos, human, and morphe, shape. The general idea is that messages and morals can be applied in a more metaphorical context than directly saying them. And this is a storytelling technique that gets used a lot in larger studios to this day outside of the idea of furry. Disney's Zootopia and the divide between a dangerous group versus a passive group, for example. Or Pixar's Elemental and its clear allusions to race. Even one of Disney's earliest feature-length films, Bambi, was based on a coming-of-age novel by Felix Sultan, a man who was later labelled as a furry fiction writer. That being said, the furry fandom has its roots in a very different genre, science fiction. Obviously, furry is fictional, dogs do not talk after all, but it began more so in conventions about Star Trek and Superman than anything else. For much of the earlier days of the fandom, Disney was the only content creator, and it only really created with the idea of anthropomorphism for children. This was until Mark Schumeister founded Raubrazzle to make it easier for independent publishing of individuals' comics, art, with a more focus on furry creation. Indie publishing really took off at this stage, and this is where those first shreds of identity start to show through. Rabrazzle allowed artists to make something less mainstream and more to their personal creative vision, while targeting those with similar interests. Many attribute this as the start of furry. But how does this have anything to do with the queer community? 1989 was the year the first country to legalise same-sex marriage appeared, and it was Denmark. The queer union was still outlawed in almost every country and were considered publicly unacceptable worldwide by most governments. That being said, we always knew gay people existed, and we always find a way to survive under the radar. From the classic two widows who lived together, to men doing drag at war for entertainment, we have prevailed in plain sight. The reason queer identity and furry were so interlinked, and the reason that to this day, those who are not in the know hate furries, is simply this. Because queer people were afforded anonymity by this fandom. This fandom allowed you to create a character of any gender, of any size or appearance, and tailor a personality around that. But most importantly, this fandom allowed you to unapologetically be yourself. Because nobody cared who you were beneath the costume. Nobody cared who you were behind the drawing. I've also found on my own travels that a lot of furries tend to be neurodivergent in some way. And the conclusion I've come to from this put together is that either A. Anonymity of the costume allows you to unapologetically be yourself. Or B. If you're already going to be seen as socially quote unquote weird, may as well be weird and authentic. Personally, I fall into the latter category. I feel I will never blend in with what society expects me to be, so I would rather be happy standing out anyway. So 
why is identity so linked with furry? The simple answer is that imagination does not have limitations. I have seen so many personas of so many real and false species, colours, quirks and more. A lot of people tend to make their persona more of an interpretation of their ideal self, their internal self or their real self. Many furries have multiple personas to represent different parts of themselves. Some personas are chimera or dragons or lizard cats or shark dogs. In the last few years, with fursuit makers getting more adventurous, we've seen moths, lizards, skeletal creatures, anything under the moon is coming out of the woodwork, and it's truly wonderful. The creative non-limitation is providing us with so much, and it's beautiful. Why are these characters so integral in self-expression? Because of that limitless creativity. Transgender folk are able to tailor their fursona's body to their ideal body, and users online can request they be called by any name, any pronouns, and usually, I say usually because there are a few people in the mix who are jerks, but usually no one would care. The furry fandom spaces remain safe, even if you outwardly display that you are trans, non-binary, genderqueer. Diversity in the furry fandom not only comes from animal creations themselves, but from the personality and traits of the users creating them, bleeding through. The temper minute of a species, their favourite colours, ornaments, style, this all contributes to building a personal profile online. When you are surrounded in a fandom where people are saying, Hi, my name is Blank and I'm a blue Irish wolfhound. I use he, him pronouns and I'm gay. There's no need to question the queer identity because it's acceptable alongside everything else. The ability to manipulate your own fandom presence is the main draw of queer people to the furry fandom. It is safe, it is expressive, it is malleable, and it is unapologetically weird. The final little topic I'd like to just touch on in this video is personas. As a concept, they are a representation of the self as an anthropomorphic animal of some kind. Furry is a bit of a vague term in terms of how many different species, most of which are not actually very furry at all, you know, lizards, dragons, etc. But it is still the term the fandom uses. I personally have one persona. And the main reason I bring this up is because I've been able to watch my identity grow and change since my first iteration of his design. I am genderqueer. And if anyone out there is watching this video with the intent to design a fursona, or even a second or third fursona, because I know people who have multiple, you know, the ideal self, the parts of yourself you don't like, a realistic version of yourself, etc. The only advice I have in creating your fursona is to be authentic with who you are. What do you like? What looks good to you? That's what matters. It's not about other people's opinions, because it's not about creating a watertight piece of artwork no one could complain about. It is about creating something for you to express yourself and who you are and explore your own personality through. That is all I have to say on that matter. I could make a video on personas, how to create them, but personally I don't think that's my place right now, and this video is sort of a long video essay about the fandom, so I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks for listening in on this odd little mini essay. Have a good one. Have a good Pride Month.